I'm glad to be here to share my very limited personal view on the interaction between solar wind and uh, geospace. This is a very broad topic, but I will focus on a very narrow uh, area. Uh, the title I hear come, uh, actually is motivated uh, by uh, this uh, cartoon from the internet. It says, oh yeah, Earth is under the attack from the solar wind. So if there's some attack on, you know, in geospace, you need to fight back, right? Otherwise, you could destroy the uh, geospace. So that's why I said, OK, there must be some feedback processes that keep the geospace stable. Otherwise, if you have a positive feedback, then the, it will be uh, destructive. So you've got to be some uh, negative feedback process that keep uh, uh, geospace stable, back to the uh, quiet condition, for example. Okay, that's the motivation. Uh, we know that, uh, at least here, the five areas, we know that all those regions are very well. Um, not very well, maybe some of them. So I want to talk about this uh, mostly, uh, as I said, I did lots of visceral mode wave uh, electron uh, interactions through simulations and observations. So I just focus on that in different regions, all of those uh, uh, four, four, three regions. And then, uh, 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 by observing auroras, we can trace back what happens, uh, for example, reconnection and the KH instability due to the viscous interactions between solar wind and the magnetosphere, and also the energy input to the ionosphere thermosphere system, so how the thermosphere composition changes and the thermosphere fire back. So that's uh, uh, my uh, other line. So this is a sketch that uh, people know that don't want to focus on this. Uh, but more importantly, the two uh, major process uh, in the geospace, I think, is uh, one is the reconnection, that's bringing particles of energy from solar wind to the magnetosphere. Another one is the viscous uh, interactions, because the high solar wind speed interact with the uh, magnetic pulse that uh, is mostly standing still, so you create the cage instability in waves. So those will uh, uh, change the process, and we see those effects as well. So first, uh, the first layer of defense, uh, the, I just used this scheme, is that the bar shock and the fall shock here. There's a, there's a, there were lots of study on this. The important thing feature here, actually, is the solar wind. Actually, there's a, a electron beams back to the so, uh, solar wind uh, at around the elect, uh, electron fall shock here because the uh, acceleration, because it magnified, solar wind come toward the Earth and interact with the bar shock here you got acceleration, the beams goes back this way. So we see be, uh, those beams actually are unstable to the whistle mode waves. So we do see those lots of whistle mode waves generated from the beam. That's the ev evidence we see. OK, uh, here's actually what we see here. This is a geotail observation in the foreshock region. And what we can see, this is the frequency and the time, this is spectral intensity of the magnetic field. You can see this bursty uh, enhancement of waves, the low frequency waves. This is a 50 uh, hertz, actually, very low frequency. About, uh, remember, it's a half of the electron cyclone frequency. So those bursty waves, uh, what are those waves? First, on geotail, we they have uh, waveform captures, high frequency waveform data. So we are able to capture all those details. You can see this is the one of the bursts of the waveform. And the three components of the magnetic field what do you see? This is spectral. It's a narrow band. And if you do a holograph, we see it's a really right circular uh, polarization. So that's confirmed. This is a uh, whistle model waves. And you can see the uh, K, we also able to uh, estimate the K vectors going toward uh, the tail. So why we see those bursty waves here? As I said, because the observation showed that there are some electron beams in the foreshock. So OK. Here we have a model here. Uh, this is a cold uh, plasma, cold electron for, us, for the solar wind. And this is the refracted beam, this is a, a hot electron beam with temperature endostropy that the perpendicular temperature is higher than parallel. So for this plasma system, it's unstable for the Wiesnerworm waves. So we first did a kind of a linear dispersion calculation for this system. You do see this is a dispersion in two branches. And you see one of the branches is uh, unstable with a positive growth rate and over a very uh, limited uh, k-vector range. So this is a linear theory. 
how about we did also did a particle simulation, a full particle electromagnetic simulation. Here again, it's, this is a cold uh, plasma, just like a solar wind emission. This is a hot electron beam with the temperature and entropy. This is time equal zero start here. You can see that these particles slowly diffuse, reduced in the perpendicular velocity, and the, uh, the parallel velocity actually is increased. The thermal velocity is increased. Eventually, you see overtake y. Uh, this is a, so this diffusion from perpendicular direction to the parallel direction actually give out, give out the energy to the wisdom of waves. And why the cold plasma actually here doesn't change much. Here is actually, uh, at this time, we did a, a wave analysis because the uh, uh, simulation provided everything. So we can see this uh, dispersion. You can see that in the narrow wave uh, frequency range, you have a growth of high uh, amplitude uh, waves. So that's confirmed. Yeah, indeed, uh, we can uh, use wave observations of wind thermal waves to back out some uh, plasma properties. The reason is that in geospace, if you have a plasma with a magnetic field, you always expect some uh, cyclone waves, such as wind thermal waves. So for the electron force shock, we did kind of a statistical analysis based on geotail data. This is a number distribution. You see, we uh, found lots of events in the force shock, but uh, because this uh, uh, divided the events according to a distance, D, that's the geotail location to this uh, force shock edge. So here's actually the uh, resonant energy. Let me see, yeah, it's the resonant energy versus the distance. You can see the resonant energy decreases from 80 eV down to almost uh, maybe 10 eV. The reason is that when you go further down, the D increases further down this region, the acceleration is going to get weaker. So that's why this, uh, the beam of electrons is going to be getting uh, smaller. So that uh, is consistent with the measurement and uh, uh, also other uh, simulations as well. Now, we also able to, because even geotail, they can go uh, the large uh, uh, distance uh, to the solar wind. So we also did uh, analysis for the resonant energy of uh, uh, wisdom waves in the solar wind. What we can see, there's an isolate with strong peak here, around uh, 100 or 120 eV. Why there's such a peak here? The reason is that very simple, uh, because in the solar wind, you have a cold plasma, but also have a super thermal uh, plasma electrons uh, with energy around 100 eV. That, I will talk about more about this. This 100 eV electrons, when you uh, when have a daylight reconnection, so they can get into the pole cap and become pole ring electrons. That's the normal pole ring source. That's the uh, this is super thermal electrons. So you can see this is a more wave observation. It's a very useful and uh, low cost instrument to do lots of uh, plasma uh, kind of diagnostics. So those are actually the, those are very weak uh, wisdom waves, but the most intense wisdom waves were observed near the bar shock, around the bar shock, actually. This is actually the one, one example, also like a burst T wave, the frequency a little bit higher, but the, the f uh, magnitudes are very, very strong. And uh, we also have this uh, kind of burst T wave structure very similar, very nicely uh, low uh, narrow band uh, waves. If you do a uh, holograph analysis, you got this very similar circular uh, polarization. Notice the magnitude here. The previous event is just about uh, uh, less than 100 picotosla for the uh, 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 amplitude. But this one is uh, 1,000 picotosla. That's uh, about uh, one, nanometer, uh, 1 nanotesla. This is almost 10% of a background uh, magnetic field in the solar wind, because solar uh, magnetic field the magnitude is about uh, 5 to 10. So this is a huge uh, uh, amplitude. We believe we are also uh, you know, carry away uh, some of the uh, uh, plasma energy to the further distance. That's uh, have to dissipate this uh, solar wind energy, because the ball shock uh, reduced the uh, uh, the bulk velocity through the heating process. Now let's go to the magnetic sheets because as I said, uh, once you have a plasma, you have a magnetic field, you always see waves. This again, this is uh, an uh, event that uh, you see two frequency. One is a low frequency, one is a very high frequency. 
Both of them are actually light circular uh, uh, polarized, and they are both uh, whistlemore waves. So in the in the magneto sheets, because the the solar moon was heated, and uh, so there's lots of uh, those uh, waves, and especially this uh, ion, the so-called uh, uh, non-oscillating uh, mirror model waves. That's modulated magnetic field, and this modulated magnetic field will affect electron uh, uh, thermal uh, distribution, so create a perpendicular thermal uh, temperature anisotropy. So that's created those whistle more waves. More interesting because we have uh, there's lots of sources uh, in the manual sheets. So sometimes, so this uh, wave uh, analysis can tell whether this source region is passing the the satellite or not. For example, this is a unique case here. Usually we see the K vector is just one direction. That means the source region is far away from the satellite. So this is the true. And then later on, you see still see one K vector going this way. But some later on, we see uh, that the wisdom wave propagated in the two opposite directions simultaneously. What that mean? We think that the source region was uh, Get into geotail was in the source region, so that you see both way. And later on, actually, when this uh, uh, source region passed away from uh, geotail could do, do the light side, we found that the K vector only goes to the uh, sunward. So that means this uh, uh, source is away on this side. So you can see that based on just simple wave and uh, observations, you can see a lot, uh, uh, find lots of process in this plasma. Now let's go back to the plasma sheet. The plasma sheet, of course, uh, there's always uh, lots of things going on. And the features here, actually, in the plasma sheet, the waves are more continuous. You don't see the uh, burst is like a short period of a uh, wave, but more or less continuous over a long time. Again, it's a, it's a, it's a circular. You notice this, you know, the ma magnitude is just a 20 picotus. Like it's far smaller than the bow shot. But the never is. This one also provides information about the plasma process in the tail. So we did, again, a, a, a statics analysis. This is a geotail goes around uh, lots of locations in the geotail. So we calculated uh, uh, the resonance energy. And you can see in the deep tail, the resonance energy is around uh, 1 keV. When you, once you go to the near the Earth, the resonance energy could be up to 100 keV. So that's the reason because of the way, actually the reconnection in the tail to push the plasma uh, back to the uh, near the Earth and accelerate them. So that's a part of uh, Whistler analysis. Now let's go to the aurora observations because the reconnection uh, on this side, as I mentioned, that bring plasma from solar wind. Indeed, that in the cusp region, this is a geo uh, sorry, this is a GUVI observation. You can see. There's a day side, a very thin aurora arc, different cases. And we have a simultaneous that the DNSP part uh, uh, goes through this and see, yeah, this is actually the, the solar wind particles, low energy. Uh, uh, so that means, indeed, those regions are the uh, open uh, cusp region and all on open field line. The important information here that from this UV measurement is that you see, this thin uh, cusp aurora covered a very wide uh, local time range. You see, like from the 9 MLT to even 15 MMT. What that means? That means the reconnection size on the magnetic poles cover this much uh, MLT. Uh, so this is actually is very important information for the either modeling or something because that's determine the total energy coming into the uh, uh, magnetosphere. Uh, another important, so another important is uh, uh, this local time curve. Also, the second one is the location, the ma uh, magnetic latitude of this uh, cusp on the, uh, at the noon. Because uh, we are lucky that we the Goovy observation. Yes. This actually because this is FUV, so we see all. Daytime, nighttime. Uh, we, uh, so that's the beauty of UV. If it's visible, you wouldn't be able to see on daytime. Right. Yeah. So, so this actually because we cover. Yes. Uh, 
unfortunately, uh, because I have uh, too many slides, uh, uh, you see, this is actually from paper. We, uh, if you go to this paper, you can see, uh, I, I didn't put that. Uh, this is DMSB pass. You see this, uh, uh, this is open, this is a poor rain uh, signature here. The reason we have this bright is both electron, low energy electrons, and as well as the protons so with the 1 keV energy. No, no, the, we, we see lots of cases like this. So it's a, it's a base. If it's BY, it's a, they will shift the location. It's not symmetric. If it shift the downside or that side, but the mostly is a, a source of the BG, so it has to be largely negative to have this broad. This, this is actually a very intense stone here. But the, I will show that when, if the BG turns northward, I do see cusp aurora just like a single spot. Yeah. That's what the, probably you got the impression from that. But for the source word IMF, the cusp is very wide and narrow. So I will show some, because uh, Groovy covered the you know, last solar cycle, so that the solar maxima is very active. So we are able to see the location of day side, the cusp location, and how they change it with IMF uh, BG. This is actually the, OK, this is the IMF BG, and uh, from 0 to almost nine, minus 50. And this is the day side um, cusp location in the magnetic latitude. Those dots are the groovy observations. And there are also other you know, early reports that those are, this fitting lines is always linear. And if you have a limited data here, like this, if you have a, a cluster like this, when you do fitting, you tend to have a linear uh, relation with the BG. The, the beauty of these super stones or intense stones is that add a few more points here. That's a raw to the fitting that is literally nonlinear, just like a saturation. So that probably when you be this further down to the source of world, this location probably doesn't change much. The reason is that the Earth's defense, again, the dipole field, you know, the magnitude is, uh, is nonlinear dependent on radian, uh, distance, uh, radio distance, right? So when you have a, uh, this uh, cusp is connect, uh, created by reconnection, anti-parallel reconnection. Okay. This reconnection happens when the RMF, the magnitude, and Earth's magnetic field is the same magnitude. If one is much larger, you don't, cannot do a reconnection. They are very similar. The, so once you have a large uh, BY, and then you peel off the onion of uh, Earth's magnetic field, when you go to the low air shell, the magnetic field increases nonlinearly, it's a very, uh, you know, a cube, a thin cube of the R. So then you have to be stopped there because it's such a nonlinear. And this also explains that there's a very narrow cusp because a small change in the distance, the magnitude of the Earth's magnetic field changes enormously. You cannot, so that's only the reconnection happens on a narrow range. So here, actually, the dipole mo uh, model, but why this is a slower than dipole model? I think because probably solar wind pressure compresses the day side magnetosphere, so push everything, uh, there's, a, there's a shift down uh, to the low air shell. So that's the application of uh, one of the application of uh, aurora observation to see how this uh, magnetic Earth's defense uh, from the solar wind. Again, uh, this reconnection also created other phenomena called patch, sporo patch, that enhance the uh, ionosphere density. That's a cold, uh, cold plasma. This is actually the old sky camera uh, measurement of a 16300 Armstrong uh, at the Eureka. This is uh, near the magnetic pole. What do we see here? The enhanced this radiance is due to recombination uh, of uh, ionosphere and the new, uh, and the electrons, all plus and electrons. By following these features, you know, you see have a corners. This is quite stable. So we are able to estimate the drift velocity of those patches. Then we connect this drift velocity with the IMF. We have a number of events here, actually this is a BZ and the patch, this patch velocity. The interesting thing here, if the BZ is below zero and maybe minus eight, uh, you see basically linear correlation. You know, B, uh, velocity goes up with a further negative. However, if a BZ below minus 10 nanotesla, even though we have limited data here, but you can see they tend to saturate again. 
this doesn't uh, change much. The orientation of a velocity, of course, is controlled by, uh, clearly controlled by the uh, IMF clock angle. So how do we expand this? Uh, because the velocity of ionosphere in this is from uh, F region, so that means mostly electric field, E cross B drift. So how do electric field saturate? This is actually, uh, so when I look at this, then I look at a few uh, papers as I found, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, they, many decades ago, actually, there's a uh, uh, formula that's a polar cap potential drop equals uh, solar wind dynamic voltage minus this uh, field line current over sigma. Sigma is the solar wind critical conductance. This is collision risk conductance. How do they calculate it? Actually, uh, I don't know, but that's the value they have here. So once you have, uh, see, uh, so solar wind increase, the field line current increase. This is a, a, almost a constant. So the polar cap potential actually, is, if we, this one increase, I, the fuel line kind of increase, that relatively speaking, this one didn't increase that much. So if this, the increase, this one, and the cancel each other, this polar cap potential could be saturated. So that's the, I think, the, the major reason. So that means there's something in the solar wing. They have some collisionless conductance that's a limited impact of solar wind on the polar ionosphere. There's simulation to support this uh, uh, calculation, and also there's another different study said this saturation happens when the solar wind electric field is larger than three millivolts per meters. If we assume the typical solar wind speed, this come up a critical BZ, MFV is about 7.5 nanometers. So. It's such a good coincidence. That's really what we see when you, you know, uh, BZ is less than minus eight. So you see the saturation effect. So all those come together, so it looks like uh, it's uh, give you a, a, cons a consistent story of these interactions. Okay, when uh, we talk about, remember we talk about this Paul Rain from the uh, wisdom of wave observations. Indeed, so this is just an example we see the Paul Rain or Goofy observation again, and this is the northern hemisphere, this is the aurora over, and you see in the polar cap, there's nothing there, it's black, you don't see any detectable emission. However, in the southern hemisphere, the same orbit, of course, later liberty, you see the aurora just fill up the polar cap. There's a, there's a, it's a more or less uniform, and plus there's a gap between this uh, uh, diffuse aurora or uniform aurora uh, and the poleward edge of aurora over. What happened here? Again, I think uh, we, this is related to the data anti parallel recognition, bring this uh, pole ring electrons uh, into the pole cap. Why we see aurora uh, like this? Because uh, here I show some, uh, you know, coincident uh, DMC particle data. What we see here, the uh, ion uh, flux, the precipitation, you can see that uh, this is all over here, and this is also all over. In the middle of a pole cap, there's nothing there. So that means there's no, uh, uh, this is probably an open field line. Look at the electrons. Actually, this is uh, electrons, uh, it's a, a, a thing that's called KEV pole ring. Normally, uh, pole ring is uh, the energy is around 100 EV, as I mentioned. But sometimes, because the corona heating is going on, it's, it's crazy. So you created a high energy pole ring or uh, super thermal. That's more or less uh, smooth. And uh, particle data also see this narrow uh, region. There's a gap between this pole ring and uh, roll over. Just to expand this region, we can see more clearly there's a gap here. That's an interesting thing here. We see the dispersion in the uh, pole ring electrons. We know in the cusp region, for the ion, the connection creates ion you know, dispersion. When I go to the uh, deep tail, you, the energy is, uh, is, uh, is higher because uh, energy is low because it takes a long time to come. This thing happens, same thing. This is nice, but for the electrons, why there's such a thing? So we think that's probably related to the reconnection in the tail because only the connection can create this uh, dispersion. To confirm that, because the nice side reconnection, because on this side, reconnection open up a field line. If there's no reconnection on the nice side, you, you end up with the uh, open field line everywhere, right? So you've got to be balanced or kind of fight back. So we, did, we use APL open field line tracing model and uh, just put particles in the reconnection region and then ready to go and with no new particles. And uh, 
those particles they'll then uh, move uh, cross field line as well as uh, around field line to the pole region. So what you can see, we do see exactly the same phenomena. Why there's a dispersion? Because once you have a you know, reconnection location, you have a population of high energy, low energy electrons. Once the reconnection happens, you cut off the surprise, right, the supply of uh, new particles. So those particles uh, originally on the field line, we are coming down to the Earth on, around the field line. At the same time, they have an uh, E-cross drift across the field line. So the high energy particles, because there's a high velocity, power of velocity, they coming down first, and we suffer very limited uh, e cross p drift. While low electrons, they, they take longer time to come to the ionosphere, and then the e cross p drift uh, distance larger. So that's why we see this dispersion. The usefulness of this information, because uh, that dispersion uh, uh, depends on actually the distance between the reconnection location and ionosphere. So we uh, develop a method to, uh, to get the reconnection distance around the field line between the reconnection and the ionosphere. And we have two examples here. One is the when BG is uh, uh, about around zero, actually the one BG. The distance based on this uh, dispersion relation, we found that the field line is about 67 uh, Earth radius. For this one, actually it's a, a highly source word, 11 and uh, minus 11. Nanometer, uh, 10 tesla, we see that the, the distance is 113 uh, e, so almost doubled. So that's the reason be because uh, for a, so a strongly source world IMF, the tail is highly stretched. So the reconnection region probably go down to the deep tail. Okay, that's the, uh, the, the beauty of these uh, observations. One more thing is actually uh, the solar uh, polar ray electrons are mostly uh, as we think it's a uniform and structureless. However, sometimes we do we do see structured uh, polarine aurora, just like this example. This is an image satellite FUV observation again. Time goes this way and uh, what we see here initially you see probably nothing. They suddenly they say you see patch like aurora appear, and then move anti sunward once they pass the magnetic pole they should develop a down dust around the structure and they keep moving anti sunward until you meet with a nice orbit. So this is probably not very clear because the spatial resolution is not that great. But uh, fortunately, we have a coincident measurement from SUSY, the MC SUSY, at the same time at this event. You can see we do see this down dust aligned uh, kind of aurora. First, we saw, oh, this is like a theta aurora rotated 90 degree, right? But uh, we have also this uh, coincident particle data tell us those are, those are due to polar ring electrons. This is not the, the theta aurora that's from the magnetic sheets. You should expect uh, uh, electrons, high energy electrons, protons. So this is actually the polar ring structure. And this is just one event. We find more events here, see, the different uh, days, see, even the two structures down us aligned. Why there's such structure? So we checked that uh, in the so geotail at this event, on this event, in the solar wind, we see this enhanced, this KEV uh, polar ring electrons. They are very more or less uh, structurist. There's no such a structure, you know, sharp structure we see here in the ionosphere. Solar wind, you see the particles, we see the particles in the ionosphere, we see structures. No structure in the solar wind. What happened? So we think must be something happened around the magnetic pulse because that's uh, so to confirm. We think that's probably due to KH talking about the viscous interaction between solar wind and the magnetic sphere. So to do that, we did a statistical analysis actually because we have a particle data, so we can check lots of events like this. This is another different event here. The particle is the KeV pouring again. This is the total energy flux of those electrons. You can see if there are four structures, four wave structure here. Why there's such a thing? And if you do spectral uh, analysis, wave analysis, you see, okay, this uh, the wavelength of those is a peak around the 800 and the 900 kilometers. Why this? Okay, for this event, we first always check if the solar wind particle has the same structure. Solar wind, wind satellite in the solar wind this time, the total energy flux of this, uh, those uh, channels, 
the fluctuation is a few percent, not a, you know, tens or 50 percent, as we see from DMSP. So this cannot explain what we see in the DMSP data. So, all right, let's do the statistical analysis. We've, uh, so we found lots of these polling events, and we do the, this uh, special uh, spectral analysis, this uh, wavelengths, and if you, if you include all the uh, events, that means soloing uh, velocity is above zero. You see, have this uh, very nice uh, smooth, it says nothing, have nothing abnormal. However, if you uh, divide those two groups into one higher soloing speed, one is uh, above 650 km per second, one is the uh, blue one is less than 400 km per second, you start to see the big difference. This is a blue one, it's a very smooth again, except there's a, a, a local enhancement, 140 kilometers of wavelength. For this high soloing speed spectrum, you do see this very enhanced long wavelength uh, uh, variation. This is very similar to this, uh, the wavelength of what we, I just showed you from DMSP particle data. Why? Because how do we, high, uh, we know that the cage instability usually occur in the low latitude boundary, low latitude. This aurora in the pole cap is occurs in the high latitude. We do not expect to have a cage of waves at such high latitude. But by exam this uh, uh, IMF conditions, we think it's possible for this high solar wind speed conditions that the high latitude cage wave could be unstable. Okay, this is actually the copy from this uh, 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 condition that when this term is larger than this term, not uh, assume that the k vector is always uh, from day side to night side around the x uh, direction. So for these two groups, uh, we calculate average speed, average solar wind density, average MF, uh, Bx, and uh, because this is mostly you know Bx, B, uh, By, Bz, because k is the x direction, so the only contribution is from the BX. So we calculate the left term is here, it's 2.8 something uh, plus this number. On the right term is 2.8, so it's about three times. Left term is about three times the right term for this high solar speed case. So that means KH waves under this condition is possible. That's probably explained. But we still, I think, probably need a global simulation to, assume, to confirm this. For the other, you know, without structures, low solar speed, the left turn is smaller than right turn. That means it's a stable cage where we will not grow. So that's actually consistent with what we see uh, and support the idea. Of course, we need a further investigation to make sure that really high latitude cage wave exists. So I welcome all collaboration if anybody wants to uh, interested in one simulation on this. That's for the highest solar wind speed. Now let's go back to this. Uh, what happened? There's a, there's a cusp uh, with anti-parallel recognition on this side for the BZ southward. But how about BZ northward? What happened? Now what's the cusp looks like? So this is actually a special case when the BZ is strongly northward. This uh, uh, MF3 component, BZ is a red line here. It's up to 20 or even 20, 30 uh, nano Tesla here. We calculate this uh, so-called coupling uh, efficiency or uh, uh, reconnection rate uh, using the patent universal coupling function. What you can see when the source word IMF is the coupling effect, uh, reconnection rate is very high. However, after a long time, a few, many, uh, maybe four or five hours with a long time, northward IMF, strongly northward IMF. The cup, you know, coupling the connection rate is, goes to almost zero. What that mean? What what we can see in the aurora under this kind of condition? Okay, so this is actually the the, the period this, again for the Susie aurora images, and uh, this uh, this one you see this this time you can see this very normal aurora over active aurora and with empty uh, polar cap. That's mean probably the open field line. However, later on, you can see this start day side or all over, kick in, move anti sunward. And uh, uh, sorry, uh, this is the, actually the beauty of this DMSP data have a simultaneous uh, particle data to support you, uh, to help you understand. This is the pole rain in this region, no iron precipitation. So that's the open field line here in the pole cap. So here, 
once once the, this uh, no, this are all kick in, and this is actually the pa the location of the particle uh, sensor, you can see that suddenly this location filled with uh, uh, a you know, it's different from the pole ring, the high flux of a higher energy electron precipitation plus uh, ions with energy about 1 keV to about 10 keV. So those particles su suggest that's probably uh, from plasma sheet. And then later on, this oral arc keep moving energy somewhat. You still see a small uh, probably pole cap with a little oral emission here. And the same thing, there's a, a High energy ions, electrons keep going like this around this arc. Eventually, you see, Susie didn't see any op, you know, dark region like this. They are filled with arcs. And those arcs are actually created by high energy electrons and uh, protons. That's different. Those are different from pearl rain. So, it suggests that this event, suggests after long duration with no strong northward, because of day side recognition, uh, uh, there's no day side recognition. So night side recognition keep going on. So the pole cap, pole cap become closed, actually, because you see the field of pro, uh, pole cap arcs there. Uh, not pole cap, it's a whole arc, I would say. Uh, that is so traced back the uh, plasma sheet. At the same time, in the southern hemisphere, we have a GUI data. So for this time, you can see the same thing happen, that the arcs, row arcs, field uh, pearl cap. So what happened? We think uh, we have a very simple model here. Because under strongly northward, uh, recognition uh, still happened, but the recognition happened at high latitude, not the equal, uh, low latitude. So this is actually <laughs> typical northward MF condition. When the uh, first, as, let me see this, OK, B is, uh, B is here. So the first thing you see is the high latitude recognition. That's actually create a high latitude cusp region. And, uh, but usually just uh, one side, one hemisphere, you have a high latitude recognition. Because of the strongly northward, uh, strongly northward IMF, very, very strong. So this means the southern hemisphere, you also have an opportunity to reconnect the high latitude. So once uh, you have a uh, reconnection happen almost simultaneously in both hemisphere, you create a new cross field line, just like a green line here, on day side. Why this reconnect? This remove the open field line from the system. This after this is repeated for a long time. Eventually, the cross field line, you know, uh, expand on day side. While night side reconnect continue to remove uh, the open field line. At this stage you probably have a cross uh, crossed, uh, configuration. The whole magnet sphere is on cross field line. Probably this very small region that's still open, I cannot say. But the most of them are crossed. So when those field lines are crossed, then those originally trapped uh, plasma, the hot ions, the electrons, they can go cross field line diffusion or whatever. Uh, uh, then once it diffuses to the new uh, uh, cross field line, they can precipitate down to the ionosphere. sphere created aurora, what do you see here? So this is a very unique uh, event that uh, uh, allows us to check that this is uh, uh, what happened. Now back to pole cap arcs. Uh, that's the uh, pole cap arc was, was observed uh, um, probably uh, decades, uh, centuries ago. Uh, so this is actually uh, based on ground uh, uh, observation, the sketch, what happened. This is a pole cap. You see that those are parallel arcs and arcs. And some of them, so I didn't see any arc here. So because the uh, ground observation, they're more or less uh, sun aligned. They they often call sun aligned arcs here. Are they? But the, again, FUV observation probably provide a new information about it. Are they really sun aligned? The one big controversy is that people are always two groups that argue. Those are sun aligned arcs are on open field line. But another group says this should be on cross field line. There's a big controversy that after decades it's still not uh, resolved yet. So here actually the Guvi uh, observations here, uh, Su uh, Suzy, sorry. This is actually example I just showed before. And we have also a proton aurora. What do we see? This is uh, uh, isolated proton. This is, this is the cusp during northward that the image satellite often see. That's what the, the question. Uh, had. So this is a cusp. 
And all arcs, you, if you look carefully, this is the same location. They are joined together in the cusp region. If you want more events, so to sure, if you just have a aurora arc on one side, they still join the uh, cusp region here. And even when you have an a aurora arc like this, it is very oblique, but they still join the uh, cusp region here. Same as the symmetric case. So that's also explains why this uh, arc is tilted, because when the BY uh, uh, changes, so this cusp is moved around the data in the, in the different local time. You have a different uh, orientation. One more important of the study of Polkap arcs is that this is some uh, arc here. You see it moving in the down dust direction. We have a simultaneous uh, DMST uh, drift meter measurement. When you go across the arc, we always very often see this virus uh, uh, shear. And the same thing here, we always see this virus shear associated with uh, these arcs. And there are more, many more events. For, you see, for this event, the arc is actually down, down it, sorry, it's a purely sound line in this case, but the cusp is at the here, no. You see strong virus uh, shear associated with this arc. Same as uh, with this arc there. So this is a very common feature. Uh, that the plasma velocity associated with those arcs. What that mean? What this tell can tell us? First, because once you have velocity shear, you have a field line current. Once you have field line current, you you can have a field line acceleration because of the current voltage relation, right? So that means those oral arcs, as long as you have velocity shear, can happen on either cross field line or open field line. If it's an open field line, this flux shear can accelerate those electrons in a certain way, so, so it creates sufficient flux to create an aura. And on open cross field line, if you have already high energy uh, particles and you have a flux shear, you have you add another uh, energy to those particles. That's fine. You still create an aura. I think this concept, this flux shear as well as the cusp line, probably have to unify the different ideas, whether it's on cross field line or cusp, because you see cusp. Those arcs join the cusp. Cusp is on the open field line. So that means at least part of, at this side part of the oral arc could be on open field line. While on that side, because the plasma could be drifted into the system, into the arc, could be on a uh, uh, cross field line. But once you have this uh, uh, velocity shear system set up, you can see oral arc either on cross field line or open field line or mixed. That's, uh, or, uh, I think, my hypothesis to be tested in the future. But the, what I want to see is that because this acceleration due to the thrust shear, the electron coming down, but what happened to ions? Um, ions have to be accelerated upward. Indeed, we see those uh, events here. Uh, this is actually Groovy uh, uh, Aurora map. Again, you can see this uh, Aurora arc extent. Unfortunately, it's not complete. But at the same time, uh, the cluster uh, satellite in the magnetosphere uh, runs through this region. What they see is that this, this is the ion outflow uh, flux here. For example, this is the H plus, this is the O plus. Even though H plus have a div, you know, solar wind source as well as an uh, ionosphere source, but the O plus, this is a, this, look at this uh, narrow band, that means the cold ions, but accelerate. The O plus, cold O plus in this class data, that means those ions has to be from ionosphere, and has to be around this oral arc. And is all those connected to the field line acceleration. The same electric field accelerate electron down and ion up. So even during quiet time, the, the ionosphere and the magnetosphere still fight back in the drive, providing this ion uh, to the magnetosphere, even probably go, go to back to the solar wind. Uh, I want to skip the aurora uh, over region because that has been studied for uh, uh, much. But I want to focus on the sub aurora. We talk about uh, this uh, pole region, cusp aurora, uh, or, uh, pole ring aurora. And uh, so now going to the low latitude, sub aurora latitude. Because the beauty of FUV measurement is that it gives you all proton aurora as well as other electron aurora at uh, the same time. So first, actually, uh, this is actually a Groovy aurora model I brought here. There are lots of features 
uh, we report the given different names. For example, day side detection or a convection around the arc, and the night side detection. This is the reason is that at that years ago, when we see those features, we don't understand what's going on. So just like blind people touch the airframe, they will find, oh, this rig, this uh, tail. <laughs> so give a different name. But after years of observation, when we put all those measurements together, we start to see, oh, yeah, all those things are come from probably ring count. They're from similar latitude, and probably associated with the, uh, iron, hot ions, and they are probably from ring count. And uh, then we call it ring count aurora. I will give you some examples there. Yeah, pouring or uh, drift, uh, you know, anti sunward. This is just one example here. Uh, this is a uh, proton aurora from image satellite, and see so you can uh, northward IMF condition in the quiet time. Suddenly, on the day side, it detect, you know, it's called day, day side detect. It's a very broad, bright <laughs> proton aurora, even even brighter than the, what happened in the aurora over. What happened? So we have to check the solar wind condition. Okay, this is associated this one. Not so with the MIF, this is a dynamic pressure of solar wind. There's very uh, high uh, you know, uh, electron, uh, the pressure enhancement here. But that's what happens that this is a pressure in compress the magnetosphere. So push this uh, particles, the two process, change the worst cone because of compression. So a particle can get into pro original trapped ring kind of ions precipitate into the atmosphere. The second, actually, we often see uh, EMIC wave associated with uh, ring, uh, uh, proton aurora. Because EMIC waves are just like a whistle, electron whistle more waves. Once those waves grow, they will change the, you know, in, uh, reduce the particular energy and increase the parallel energy. That means change the pitch angle of particles. So those particle can, it, EMIC wave can drive those particles into Roscoe. <coughs> So that's why this is actually, this is giving advantage, that's the ring current. And sometimes we see two of those arcs. Why is that? Actually, ring current, if you look at this uh, measurement, ring current have two peaks uh, at the different air shell. That's the source with that. And more interestingly, actually, uh, this is a bigger stone again. This is an image satellite, a simultaneous groovy measurement on night side. When we first see night side, this uh, aurora patch uh, like this, it's uh, oh, something's going on, you know, some, might be something wrong. However, when, see, when we start to see the image data, same thing happened here. And we see this repeatedly uh, for many times. I'll say, okay, this is not the noise or some contamination. Those are real emission. This is uh, actually from the ring kind of just a, what, but this is on the nice side. So what happens, I said, uh, this is uh, a, because stone time, this is actually a nice side uh, 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 ring kind of aura. It usually happen during the recovery phase of a uh, stone. So what happens is here, actually, during stone time, this is a plasma sphere ima image data, EUV image data, tells you what's the structure of a plasma sphere. And this one is the uh, ring kind, partial ring kind during stone time. So during stone time, actually, the electric field quickly erodes this uh, plasma sphere. And the ring kind of slowly build up. So they, they don't interact with each other. However, during the recovery phase, this ring kind of still there. They, they you know, recover very slowly. But the, this uh, plasma sphere recover very fast. So then this one they overlap with each other. Once overlap here, then they, you set up the uh, wave particle interaction and the reason, because the cold plasma need to set up the, the background waves, that's the frequency, and why hot uh, plasma provide energy to drive this ring, part of ring current into the loss current to create what we see here. And uh, here, actually, the, the other measurement, wave measurement, see, it, indeed, in this region, you see lots of uh, EMIC waves. It's the exact same region here. So that's actually confirmed that this wave particle interaction is so important to redistribute uh, the ring current uh, distribution, or get, uh, remove the ring current particles. One important feature is how the ionosphere fight, or plasma sphere uh, fight back. This one, remember there's a prune actually. Sometimes this prune can extend to the day side and even cr cross the day side magnetic poles. Here's actually the cartoon here. The stone time in a prune or, or, or SED, some, 
they can go across uh, this data the many ports. So what happens once they go across the port, the many ports where this low latitude the reconnection happens? According to this formula, that the reconnection rate depends on the magnetic field in both sides and as well as density uh, in, the, in the magnetic sheets and also inside the magnetosphere. So we, when you prune come this high, dense, high density plasma, so that you increase the density of plasma here. So once you increase this term, the reconnection rate goes down. So that's a, another part of a negative feedback effect. The atmosphere and the plasma atmosphere can try to resist the change imposed by solar wind. So when we talk about ring current, we have to talk about the e uh, energetic uh, neutral atoms. Because uh, the reason I'm talking, this is the image set of measurement of ENA. And this is the retrieved ring current uh, for this measurement. Uh, why do we care about this? Because when you see image satellite is a few Earth radio far away from the Earth, measure this one. That's what that means. Those ENA is escaping from the ring kind of into the space. So because the ENA is neutral, they probably do, uh, not controlled by a magnetic field or electric field. They just go straight uh, to the back to the solar wind. This is, a, for example, if it's O plus or H plus. That's the, ma the major feedback effect. There's a removed particles that solar wind get it into the system through this charge exchange. At the same time, why the charge exchange enhance during storm time? Because the thermosphere, the heating causes thermosphere expansion. So the dense, neutral density is as high at a high attitude. So that's one effect. Ring kind of flux is also in enhanced. So when these two terms, the, this EN flux, is the, because of the charge exchange, so the flux is depends on neutral density times the ring current flux. So it's a double effect. The thermosphere also contributes this uh, uh, removal of the ring current ions. While this ring current ions can uh, expect to the space, at the same time they can uh, go down because they can go all kind of direction, going down to the Earth. <laughs> and we see auroras due to this. And this is, again, this is a uh, super stone, actually. This is a goofy aurora images in you know, five colors. We see all of them. Normally, on the night, this is actually the aurora over, the, the, the saturated one. In the equatorial region, the, we usually see just uh, like this. It's dark. There's no particle precipitation, precipitation that created aurora here, especially LBH uh, band. But sometimes, we do see aurora everywhere on globe. What, what's happened here? If we plot the equatorial region uh, intensity versus the DST, you can see once DST goes up, this flux uh, aurora radiance goes up. And further, because the image satellite has a uh, ENA flux, goes to space, right, I just show. So we just uh, uh, plot, scatter plot with, uh, uh, let me see, this uh, radiance, uh, aurora radiance in low latitude versus uh, ENA flux. What you can see is basically quasi-linear correlation. So this confirms that the aurora emission, this is actually global uh, aurora emission, is caused by the uh, neutral particles. So there's another way that the ring can remove uh, particles through charge exchange. Now, uh, finally, uh, back to the low attitude, thermosphere, atmosphere. So we know the stone time, we have lots of energy uh, dumped into the uh, high latitude region, geoheating, particle heating, and the change the composition uh, of thermosphere as well as the uh, atmosphere density. So here I want to show one example here. Uh, this is a Govi O2N2, uh, it's a very popular product. And this is quite time, you see, only see this uh, gradient from the summer to the winter, that's because the background wind create this a small gradient. At the same time, the beauty of GUVI data right now, we are operating in a spectrograph data. So while we are still able to get all to end ratio, we are able to get a nitro oxide current density. Because the long wavelength end, there's a so-called NO epsilon band. That is a scattering, uh, that's the uh, scattering, solar resonance scattering through the NO uh, molecule. So the quiet time, you see, yeah, really very low value, and except it's a high latitude localized enhancement. By the way, this is the SA uh, contamination should not be uh, uh, 
considered. Now, this is a quiet time feature. If a stone hit, we know the O2 N2 uh, goes down. And you see depression, actually, for this case, depression goes to the equator, actually, in the northern hemisphere. For the southern hemisphere, it's also very good, go to very low latitude. What happened here, this is, this is a well known. The, the NO core density, the amazing thing is that you see, same time, you see, have a, once you have depression, you see NO enhancement. The reason for this is because NO is probably produced in the oral region uh, because of particle as, uh, precipitation as well as geo heating. And, uh, and uh, the neutral wind created by all those heatings bring those NO enhanced air as well as uh, uh, O2N2 depleted air to the middle low latitude. That's why those are anti correlated. The, the importance of this NO, even though it's a, a minus species, because it's very strong uh, infrared radiation from this, actually, this cool down the thermosphere. So, actually, Dolores, she did a very good job that he said, okay, thermosphere fights back. That's why they use the term it's here, the atmosphere fight back, fights back, manosphere. She reported this, uh, uh, some events, there's a, called a problem event, there's a large blue one. And the, dense, uh, the blue one, the, uh, let me see, uh, yeah, the density of a blue one actually is smaller than the model. She found that the, this anomaly is because there's a strong uh, infrared from nitrogen oxide. So that's even though it's a minor species that creates lots of problems, cause a bigger problem. And even worse, actually, uh, Ray, he reported that there's an overcooling effect during this, this sport, uh, strong storm. And this is the champ global mean, I guess. You see, this is a pre stone values here. After the cover, the, the value, the density of a champ, even lower than the previous stone value. And uh, he found that during this storm, there's a strong cooling, NO cooling rate here. He connected the cool, NO cooling to the, this uh, over cooling, low density. So if we, I just report the champ data here and with DST for the same event, but are limited to the uh, day side from 10 to 15 uh, LT local time and the middle latitude from 30 to 40 uh, degree. What do we see here, the DST and uh, so this is actually the pre stone value of a neutral density at the champ's location. And even the first, actually at middle latitude, the first stone already created this uh, uh, kind of an overcooling effect. If you go to the after second stone here, the, the reduction of neutral density is about 30% of the pre-stone value. That's quite significant. So that means we have to include nitrogen oxide in the models to, yes. And according to the I think spectrum, the 5.3 micron. Okay. There's a specific wavelength, very, very strong, yeah. So right now, the current understanding is NO cooling because uh, stone time, you produce lots of NO. That's uh, also, that's a negative feedback effect of a system that cool down the thermosphere. So, you know, reduce the density enhancement. But that's just one uh, hypothesis. There's still an unsolved problem. Let's check another big stone. This is actually the same year, just one month later. I plot the same plot, the same latitude, the same local time. This is DSC, actually the, the minimum DSC is even lower than this stone, right? Here. However, if you look at the density of the same, from the same satellite, this is the pre-stone value here. You didn't see the overcooling for the bigger stone like this. Why is that? Is that the precondition value, uh, condition, or the history? Because you have multiple stone here, you, you, you keep heating, keep creating nitro oxide, or this is isolated, you didn't create much of, of uh, NO or something, or whether this is particle prestige spectral, it may be different. So the efficiency of creating nitro oxide is different. What's going on? So there's still open question that to answer what's going on here. 
Before I finish, I'd like to, because the solar eclipse happened just a couple of weeks ago, right? Everybody is interested in that. So I want to show just a couple of slides uh, what we see uh, from Susie. Here, actually, the totality is here. Uh, this is a partial eclipse. And the Susie actually goes through this partial eclipse, eclipse region. This is what we see here. You see the uh, reduction in the radiance. That's what you expected. And the, the next orbit actually goes further down to the, uh, you know, rest uh, 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 eclipse region. So we see the less reduction in the radiance. So that's also expected. So we are now trying to figure out what's the impact of this, uh, how, you know, to the uh, neutral composition, for example, but it's still under uh, investigation. And this one actually uh, is a goofy measurement after uh, eclipse and uh, between different two orbits. You see, this is a 13 or 4 to the orbit, previous orbit, and when the eclipse comes, you see the uh, radiance going down. Same as the 1356, and LBH short. So we do see, but we didn't see the tutorial, unfortunately. All right, so I come to my summary. Uh, the first one is to see the dual space try to resist the changes imposed by solar wind through all different you know, feedback processes. Uh, I feel that the rain count ENA is the most important uh, way to send those ions back to the solar wind. So get lost in the solar wind, that's the feedback effect. And also the thermosphere uh, infrared radiation, especially from the, this uh, natural oxide uh, emission, removed the energy, original solar wind kinetic energy, you know, converted through the process to the heat energy and the back to the space. So keep us safe and not it just, uh, you know, destruct the dual space certain way. So this is feedback, to understand those feedback process are very important to, for, for example, for the space weather forecast. We need to consider all those different terms to accurate to forecast space weather because that's what we are leaving here. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, uh, this, uh, it's, it's also shear. The velocity actually is a difference. Uh, should I, say, I forgot to say, that the velocity is a difference between upstream and downstream. That's the velocity shear, yeah, yeah, got to be. Uh, as a matter of fact, at the equatorial boundary of the aurora over, we also see strong uh, velocity shear. That's probably related to SAPs. And uh, we see the, then the, uh, we see the modulation of aurora boundary and uh, the called undulation. And uh, once we run DMSP through this region, we do see strong velocity shear of the plasma. So velocity shear is everywhere. Try to you know shade up energy, convert energy from bulk of uh, energy to other uh, maybe thermal or other forms of energy. Yeah. And is the funky um, cloud condition, or it can also happen in other conditions? All kind of conditions. As I, I mentioned, for the pole cap arcs, we see velocity around the pole cap arcs. That's the northward IMF clinic, very quiet. But, but the solar wind, you see, solar wind, is, solar wind is still blowing through the magnetosphere. They create, actually, I have a simple model to uh, explain why we have many arcs, many pole arcs. The reason is that in on Frank, you create lots of uh, cage instability. And then once you create the vortex, there's a so-called uh, exchange uh, instability happens, so you become unstable, electrostatically unstable, and they have elongated the structure with the velocity shear. That the current, the fuel line current sheet coming down, that created those arcs. And that's why also these arcs have to be uh, joined together in the cusp region. Yes. Uh, 
It's about eight eight hundred or one thousand. Eight hundred, I think, eight hundred, uh, one thousand. And uh, yeah, there's twenty million lots in the minus one point five. Minus eight, probably. Yeah, yeah. A little bit too too low. low. I used to uh, <coughs> test velocity is the two velocity of the high drift or it's the same one. Yeah, assume this E cross B drift, E cross B uh, term is uh, satisfied. But do you think the path motion is the same speed as the high drift or is the line be different? Yeah, there's some other maybe process that, you know, make it. Uh, completion may be the way you can uh, just pass, right? Com uh, the of the community dimension, uh, chemical property. Uh -huh. Uh, that part actually, uh, if the composition change the patch, uh, that that could affect the data analysis. You know, the, when you estimate, if there's such a thing going on, right? So you are estimating of a velocity curve, some introduce some error. But for the case that we study is uh, we we pick up those stable patch, the the shape locate you know didn't change over the lifetime. We believe it's a transport effect, but somebody else, uh, you know, there are uh, other people say uh, it's a locally, uh, local production, right? Like a sort of X-ray or some chemical, uh, photochemical processes. But consider the shape and uh, you see the gradient, you know, high latitude is a uh, density high and when you go to the low uh, latitude, the, the NO current density becomes smaller. So you can think that, yeah, it's mostly like uh, transport effect. Yeah, if it's not a transport, how can you how can you explain the enhancement of the equator or mid latitude of the NO uh, enhancement? What's other mechanism? What's the source? What what's kind of process you, you can explain? You see, uh, and the and the I think, I think the uh, if you look at the saber data, because saber infrared radiance that depend uh, the core density as well temperatures the nonlinear depend on temperature, so they have a combination of those positive effect. The goofy one. It's just a purely uh, NO density because solar flux at that wavelength doesn't change. Over one solar cycle, probably a few percent. So over day, it may be less than 1%. So when you see those radiance change, must be due to the true uh, density change. Actually, we, are, we plan to work with the Sabre people, try to figure out by combining those two data sets, uh, can we uh, extract the temperature information from you know, those two measurements. Uh, looks like it's very similar to the O uh, or to uh, N2 depression. Same order, uh, I would say, but uh, maybe order of one day or something. So you cover this from your latitude and you keep track, or it's a uh, Unfortunately, we cannot tell the time history because uh, Goofy Susie just uh, one time runs through, then next revisit, you know, different location. And also, next orbit will be uh, 90, uh, 100 minutes later. So we cannot see the time history detail in details. That's that's the unfortunate thing. That's why probably your model modeling community can help. You know, once it's validated, can help to uh, fill those gaps. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go go to have a continuous coverage. Yes. Uh, 
wave can transport. Okay, that that that's a part. Okay, I, don't, I saw the wave is oscillation. You know, how can you move stuff? It's a, it's a local oscillation. <laughs> you have to have a wind to push. You know, move one place to another. Okay. Uh, yeah, one, one thing actually I didn't show here, actually I talked to one being uh, a few times. Actually, on the global scale, the auto N2 depletion and the NO enhancement, they are anti correlated, it's clear. However, if you look detail, it's some stone, you know, man, actually many of the stone, if you look detail, if you do line plot in certain longitude, you can start see that the, the 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 depression region peak or enhan peak enhancement or whatever the change, they do not match. So we suspect about about probably because the uh, NO peak is around 100 or 5 kilometers, O2 N2 is mostly contributed from 130 or 40 kilometers. So different two different attitudes, probably neutral wing, are probably different. So that's uh, bringing uh, different results. And locally, they they sometimes mismatch. So that's uh, that's additional, uh, you know, help can come from the uh, modeling simulations. I think that's why the NCA is a very nice place to talk to. You have lots of modeling <laughs> capabilities. So if you have any problem, you can just write and give me the answer. <laughs> I'm going to say, uh, stop here. Thank you again. Thank you very much.